So before I became a real estate agent, I was an anthropologist. I've been an anthropologist for a very long time. My first trip to Kamchatka was in 1995. And so today, kind of like Dave, I want to tell a bunch of little stories. Uh, unlike Dave, they're actually not mine. They're other people's stories because that's what anthropologists do. They tell other people's stories. These are things that I found in translation. Uh, in the early 70s, a little girl, about seven or eight years old, living with her parents, speaking only Koryak all the time, living mainly out in the tundra, uh, got captured by the authorities and taken to school. So she was hauled to school physically, stripped of her clothes in, in front of the school and washed in what was basically a trough, had her hair shaved off, and was humiliated in the beginning of her school. This woman now is a PhD linguist developing Koryak uh, curricular materials for teaching Koryak in schools and is uh, really one of my favorite teachers ever, uh, teaching me Koryak. Koryak in school uh, had a lot of mixed receptions um, in the 60s and 70s. I had one grandfather tell me about how he, when he was speaking Koryak in the school in the 50s, the teacher made him kneel on rock salt. Another little old lady told me about how she had her mouth washed out with soap for speaking Koryak, and you should only be speaking Russian. These sorts of things were pretty effective now as when I was recording stories of other people in 2013, uh, recording the last generation of fully fluent speakers of Koryak, most of these people were well over the age of 60 or 70 or 80. And their great-grandchildren, uh, let alone their children uh, in their 50s and 60s, uh, did not have full command of the language. A lot of these people's stories have some good things about teachers as well. Uh, Another granny who was a great storyteller, and in fact, uh, her job was on the radio, telling stories in Koryak. The Soviet Union is really kind of a, a weird place. You could do things uh, and get paid for it, and you could do very similar things and get punished uh, very harshly for it. So uh, this other granny who was speaking stories on the radio in Koryak had this wonderful story about uh, when she was first going to school, her teacher uh, was very kind, actually, and w was teaching uh, the kids how to speak Russian. She understood that this was going to be a two-way street, and so she was learning uh, Koryak bit by bit and teaching the kids some Russian so that they could get along in school. And uh, this other, uh, so as a little kid in the 50s, uh, her mother was worried that sending her to school that she would be hungry, so she always gave her uh, a couple pieces of dried salmon to put up in her sleeve. Uh, and so uh, when she would get bored, kind of in the, in the middle of the day, sometimes she'd pull out uh, bits of the salmon and chew on it uh, while working on her schoolwork. And this was one of her fond memories, was that the, the teacher would just kind of look the other way and wouldn't notice these sorts of things. In learning other people's stories in Kamchatka, I found that there are indeed some really dumb questions. Uh, I was interested in all kinds of things, including uh, religious belief and ritual and whatnot, and I got a lot of really interesting material about how Kauri people honor the spirits, uh, animals that they hunt, and how they commune with the forces around them. And sometimes you can call this uh, shamanism, although most Koryaks didn't really like that word. Uh, and I found this out in asking uh, a senior uh, hunter, very well-respected man in the village, do you know any shamans? And he looked me in the eye, that's already weird, and said, no, Stalin killed them all. And I'm like, hmm, well, that's a bummer. Uh, but I figured it was probably true, and it was definitely true that Stalin and his uh, fellows did kill a lot of shamans in the 20s and 30s. But as we were leaving his house, uh, my friend and other... Uh, co-folklorist, was like, Alex, that was just the worst question. Uh, Ivan, he is the most famous shaman in the entire village. You need to learn to ask better questions. So then I tried to figure out other ways to ask about, uh, so do you know anyone who talks to spirits usually? But then I learned that another important way of identifying these kinds of people who have power is, do they go for walks? The tundra is, in many ways, a very powerful place, and it is far from empty. 
It's full of not only people, but uh, all kinds of people that are not necessarily human, non-human others. And uh, so my friend that I started off the story with, uh, Valentina, who's now doing Koryak uh, materials, uh, it, her name is Wachanga. And she's named for this old fellow named Wachok, who was famous for walking the tundra by himself. And the thing is, is that walking the tundra by herself is actually pretty badass because there's lots of things out there that want to get you. Of course, there's grizzly bears that will eat you, and there's plenty of that. But they're even more important. There's uh, spirits that want to take you away. And this fellow would go out wandering, and uh, then one time he never came back. And a couple years later, she was born, and they figured that she was the reincarnation of Wachok, and so she's called Wachanga, which is the female version. And... Later, it seemed pretty clear that Valentina was also a traveler. Uh, her first marriage was with a man in Uzbekistan, and then she traveled to Leningrad uh, and studied there, and then traveled to America and visited me, and then again in Scotland. And she's done a, a, a lot of traveling, but is always returning home to do her best teaching the kids some Koryak and being a good teacher. Thank you. <laughs>